I should briefly talk about why I'm recording a number of videos here. Welcome, readings, assignments, and then policies. Um, I've been cautioned about that my videos are quite long, and they are. One of the reasons that they're long is because I think a university education, if anywhere, is a place to actually develop an attention span, right? Um, being able to um, mull over a longer, more drawn out sort of argument or uh, connections between ideas, right? durationally, it's, it's, it's an important skill and um, you can't really do philosophy without that. Right. So, um, but nonetheless, um, that's, that's why many of my videos are quite long, but it's, um, this one is also a reference video. So if you want to know about readings or assignments or general policies or that sort of thing, you ought to be able to skip to the point in the video where these things are. So um, this uh, portion of the video, will engage uh, with your readings. And uh, there are six of them. Um, I'm a little bit tricky because in the John Stuart Mill reading, uh, I have you buy two books. Um, that's to actually save you a bit of reading, right? So uh, that's why we do that. Uh, so the first book we will be engaging with um, is Plato's Five Dialogues. Um, it, we will actually only be reading two of the five. Uh, the two of the dialogues are the Apology and the Crito. And in these dialogues, what you'll find is uh, Socrates at a trial, right? The Apology is his trial defense, right? Where he's defending himself against the charges of corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the state, which might seem like pithy little charges, but for the Athenians were actually quite a big deal. Now, um, they amount basically to treason. I go into this uh, when we turn to this. But um, it, what Socrates argues is that his trial, the fact that he was brought on trial, is less about these actual charges and more about an attempt to silence someone from speaking their mind with regard to justice and virtue and all of that sort of thing in public forums throughout the city-state of Athens. So what Socrates winds up doing in defending himself actually defends and establishes a particular right that, you know, there's an important amendment to your constitution in order to defend, right? So, um, what Socrates winds up arguing here is that, well, it's a multiple step argument, is it, 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 that being able to have these conversations, to engage in this public reason dialogue about justice, virtue, happiness, and the like, right, every day is the highest expression of human capacities. It's the most fully human and excellent thing that human beings do. Now, democracy relies on our capacity to engage and have these debates and these arguments. I mean, look at the trial format itself with the reasoned arguments and the refutations and the reasoned debate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is how the courts in the budding democracy in Athens actually meet out justice. This is the very basis of justice. Right? So if we silence people in the process of making these kinds of arguments, it's anti-democratic. Democracy is good because it relies upon this expression of human capacities. Right? And democracy cannot achieve its own ends without people having the ability to speak and argue their conscience. So that sounds a lot like freedom of free speech and freedom of expression, doesn't it? Right? So the first dialogue, the apology, winds up being sort of an impassioned defense of freedom of speech, right? at the same time as it lays out the groundwork of for a Socratic ethical theory. The second dialogue, the credo, and spoilers, <laughs> uh, it takes place after Socrates has lost his trial and he's awaiting his sentence, which is to drink hemlock and die, basically. 
and for his supposed crimes. Uh, his buddy Credo comes with an escape plan that, it, that they debate about whether or not it is truly just for Socrates to escape this sentence. Right. Now, what this dialogue winds up doing is anytime you have rights, you have reciprocal duties. And we get Socrates' account of the nature of these duties to the city-state of Athens, right, in the Credo. Right. At the same time, as uh, Socrates winds up introducing uh, two important, very important notions in terms of political philosophy. So, uh, that will be our first reading here. Right? Um, so, that's where we will start. Um, and, and, like I say, I've got this class laid out in um, three sections. Uh, that is your first ancient, your second ancient, is a guy by the name of Aristotle, or if you're particular about um, pronunciations, Aristoteus right, is more accurately how it is um, pronounced. Uh, this book is called The Nicomachean Ethics, right, named after uh, Aristotle's son, Nicomachaeus, who was the editor for this book. This book is one part, of course, hard ethical theory. One part self-help book, one part child-rearing manual, right? and ultimately aims at the production of human happiness. Right? So, so the argument goes, do you want to be happy? Of course you do. Do I want to be happy? Of course I do. Can you not want to be happy? No. Right? Why do you want to be happy? That question doesn't even really make sense. Now here's one further question. What is happiness? Most of us haven't bothered to define it. What Aristotle aims to do is define happiness and come up with almost a football strategy for how we wind up bringing human happiness about. Right? That way, as he says on like to page two of this book, like archers who have a target to aim at will be better able to hit the mark. So he defines happiness. He comes up with a mechanism that accounts for the production of human happiness. He ties this notion of human happiness to virtue, and we explore exactly what virtue is. So, one of the most interesting things about this book is that Aristotle finds a role for the human emotions, right? So, happiness is about pleasure and pain and our emotions and our habitual disposition to them, according to Aristotle. Whereas, what we got in Socrates, Socrates winds up drawing a hard line between reason and feeling, desire, or emotion, right? We should listen to reasons and not engage with our feelings or desires or emotions. Right? Aristotle finds a role for them. Aristotle is such an important philosopher, it's only in the past maybe 100 years we've gotten beyond Aristotle's logic. Aristotle defined physics, he coined the term. Right? In terms of philosophy, if you know what metaphysics is, it's a theory that accounts for the underlying nature of truth. Right? He coined that term as well. Aristotle's politics is quite advanced. Right? So without Aristotle, right, we don't have most of the fields that wind up accounting for the various university disciplines that we engage with today. And he actually founded the second, not the first, but the second university in the Western world called the Lyceum. And French middle schools are still called Lycée in sort of honor of Aristotle's famous university. The first, the first university in the Western world was founded by Plato. It was called the Academy. So, if, if you're wondering about your academic progress, the, that's a reference to Plato again, right? So, um, that's what we'll engage with second in this course. Um, in terms of this book, 
Uh, just like we're only reading two of the five dialogues, we're just reading um, sections one, or two, and um, the first part of section three of the ten books of the, the Nicomachean Ethics. Right? Um, notice also that these uh, translations are from Hackett, um, it, which tend to be the cheapest books that I could possibly order. They're also very good with excellent explanatory notes throughout them. So that's section one on ancient approaches to ethics. Section two, we turn to uh, the two big heavy hitters of modern ethical theory, Manuel Kant and John Stuart Mill. It's going to be sort of bracing coming from Aristotle, right, um, who argues more or less that the reason you do the right thing is because you want to be happy, right, or the key to happiness is acting virtuously, right. Now, you know, what we get from the modern approach to ethics is that these guys are more skeptical about human nature, right. The ancients have this positive, optimistic sort of sense in which if we think about and dispose ourselves to the project of human being a human being properly, we will automatically just be good people. Whereas the moderns are a little bit more skeptical about that. Right? They see us not as necessarily immoral creatures, but perhaps amoral. Right? And morality is something that has to be reflectively added after in terms of theory and in terms of obligation. Right? So what we get from Kant is uh, probably the most advanced treatment of the notion of duty that you will ever come across. Right? Now the thing about duty is you do it. You do it not because you get something out of it. You do it not because it benefits you. You do it not because of any incentive that you could get for doing your duty. You do your duty because it's your duty. It's a categorical duty. Right? But what if I don't want to do my duty? Well, you do your duty. What if it's actually harmful for me to do my duty? Well, you do your duty. Think of soldiers in the field. They don't want to be in the field getting shot at. They are there because they're doing their duty. It's not optional. It's categorical. Right? So what Kant is going to do is lay out, we'll take a look, there are actually five, but we'll take a look at three formulations of what he calls the categorical imperative, which are basically fancy intellectual tricks for factoring out our personal inclinations and desires and looking at a moral act from the standpoint of duty. Right? So these are intellectual tricks that reveal our duty in particular situations. Right? So that'll be Immanuel Kant and this is probably the hardest theorist that we'll come across um, all semester. Like I say, I've been teaching Kant for longer than I've been teaching my own courses, so we're closing on 20 years now. So um, we should be able to get through it. Uh, and then we turn to probably the simplest theorist, um, because these things ought to balance out somehow. That's my Aristotle coming out. You'll see what I mean by that. Um, probably the simplest theorist that we'll come across in John Stuart Mill. Uh, first, uh, we're reading these in the wrong order. He published on liberty first and then utilitarianism. Um, I want to make a million argument. Right? So we're going to start with utilitarianism and then move on to on liberty. Utilitarianism is, well, it's about utility. It's about the outcome of the action. Right? Now, for Kant, uh, the moral worth of an action was determined in terms of the intention that stands behind the action, whereas in John Stuart Mill, it's all about the outcome. You know that scene in um, Revenge of the Sith where Anakin and Obi-Wan are fighting it out, that sort of thing, right? Um, and they're having this whole argument and, and ultimately they come to this notion of the ends justifying the means, 
Right? Well, for the utilitarian, the ends always justify the means. Right? Whereas the end for Kant never justifies the means. This is an end-oriented or teleological ethics that aims at producing happiness or the greatest benefit for the greatest number. Right? It's not so much happiness or pleasure, it's pleasure and the absence of pain for the greatest number. Now the odd thing about Mill's utilitarianism, and you should keep this in mind when we turn to this, is that by actually claiming that we should calculate the greatest good, not just for us, but for the greatest number, it's not a selfish moral theory. We're all pretty good at calculating the greatest good for us. This kind of cost-benefit analysis, a, a three-year-old at a toy store will do that. Do I want this toy or that toy? Which one do I want? Uh, I want that one. We've done a cost-benefit analysis because we like this one more than we like that one, right? But what Mill's saying is that we should calculate the greatest good for the greatest number and do that. And so what if the greatest good for the greatest number is served by me doing something I don't want to do? Well, the greatest good for the greatest number dictates that I should do that thing that I don't want to do even if I don't want to do it. So um, utilitarianism is a series of arguments defending the principle of utility against various critiques, right? And issuing a few critiques as well of Immanuel Kant, which is the competing ethical theory, right? On liberty is sort of an addition to the principle of utility because as I introduce utility to you, there is a guy that I will introduce you to by the name of Michael Sandel who is a professor at Harvard. And I'll introduce you by way of YouTube video. Right? He teaches a course on justice. It seems like an excellent course. He's one of these super professors that um, winds up teaching these huge sort of public intellectual kinds of courses. And he's quite good. Right? Um, he introduces you to Benthamite utilitarianism and then expands that into John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. He issues two main critiques of the principle of utility, and they're quite cutting critiques, so I wind up spending a bit of time defending John Stuart Mill against these critiques. Um, in order to engage with the second of these critiques, which are important critiques of the principle of utility, I, well, prefer to use John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, which lays out a case for liberties, that is, freedoms, civic and social liberties, right? so political freedoms, right? because the principle of utility has some pitfalls. Right? So what Mill demonstrates by adding this notion of liberty right? and um, a principle which is called the principle of harm, uh, to his utilitarian philosophy is that he is not an act utilitarian, but rather a rule utilitarian. An act utilitarian is somebody who applies the principle of utility to each and every single discrete action that they engage in. Mill doesn't tend to think that that is good enough, so one of his alterations of Benthamite utilitarianism is to actually switch to what we might call rule utilitarianism. Rule utilitarianism establishes a rule or a principle that tends to produce the greatest good for the greatest number as a limitation on act utilitarianism. It's sort of dancey, but nonetheless, right? it's something important that John Stuart Mill does. Um, and um, in terms of political philosophy, he'll also introduce to you um, three essential human liberties which um, you know, both of our governments actually wind up um, engaging with. And that's the moderns. Right? Um, so the ancients are concerned about our habits and our char character and making us good people who do fine actions. When we turn to the moderns, uh, basically what they try to produce is ethical systems, sort of uh, tricks or formulas that we can apply to each and every one of our discrete actions or 
our principles in order that we act in the right way. So these are, these are almost like moral calculators. When we turn to postmodern ethical theory, we find that we're getting a little bit skeptical with regard to the normative basis of the whole history of Western philosophy. Right? Uh, so we will turn to uh, one Mr. Frederick Nietzsche, who will um, wind up issuing a critique of what he considers the dogmatism of the Western tradition, and lays bare a whole series of prejudices of the philosophers, and specifically the moral philosophers. Right? Uh, and this is maybe one of the most insightful critiques of moral philosophy that have come out of the whole history of Western philosophy. Every time I read Beyond Good and Evil, I'm startled that it took us, like, what, 2,400 years to get to the point where we could even ask the kinds of questions that Nietzsche is asking here. And um, he'll also introduce you, but... It, because I mean, this is this is uh, the subtotal of the title of Beyond Good and Evil is a prelude to the philosophy of the future, right? So what he is going to do is at the same time as he's skeptically issuing critiques of the the the, the, uh, the moral tradition in the West, he's going to sort of project into where he thinks the future, if there is going to be a future might yield some fruit. Right? So he's going to talk about what he calls a new category of philosopher, right? which has to, by his estimation, be on the horizon, be coming on all the time. Right? And what sort of qualities and what sort of dispositions this new category of philosopher will have. It's an interesting sort of projection that Nietzsche offers that actually winds up suggesting that perhaps philosophers and theorists more generally have to be interdisciplinary rather than hard dogmatic disciplinary thinkers. Right. So um, we will turn to Frederick Nietzsche. Then finally in the course, at the end of the course, we will turn to a one Mr. Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, it, quick note about this book. It's out of print. The bookstore gets some in, but likely there will not be enough for all of you. Um, what I have done um, is there is a PDF of this book that I've uploaded to Moodle. Uh, when it becomes time um, to engage with this, uh, this material, uh, the PDF will become available of you, and it's actually a scan of this book that I ordered from Abe Books and paid uh, the whopping price of, where is the price? Yeah, there it is, $2 for it. This is a $2 book, ships free in the States. There are a bunch of copies of this online used, that sort of thing. So if you're like me and you like a physical thing, um, two bucks is what it will cost you and it'll come to your door reasonably quickly, very cheaply. Anyhow, um, this is called Existentialism in Human Emotions, and it's one of the, the, the sort of under-theorized aspects in ethical theory, right? Because when we have to make a choice, when we are in a situation where we have to make an ethical choice, these guys, many of them, not Nietzsche, but many of these guys tend to think that you should be rational. You should calculate that which is most just, that which produces the greatest good for the greatest number. We should act only according to that maxim, whereby we can will it to become a universal law. Um, don't worry about that for the moment. That's Kant. Um, <clears throat> but the point is, we should ask reason what to do, and then act on the basis of our ras rational judgment. I don't know about you, but that's not how I wind up making decisions. It's not the context in which I make decisions that are moral. Let's say I'm in a car accident and somebody is yelling at me because I hit their car, that sort of thing. I'm sweaty, my heart is beating, my hands are shaking, and I'm just trying to deal with the situation. Let's say you're in a fight with your significant other about something. Your blood is boiling, you're really mad, and that sort of thing, etc., etc., etc. What Sartre does 
while introducing an existential approach to ethics, right, is he forecasts, not forecasts, foregrounds, not forecasts, he foregrounds um, that element of human existence, which is passion, impassioned, engaged in context, and laden with emotions. So effectively what Sartre is arguing is that when you're in a moral situation, here are some emotions that you are going to experience. And what's more, you should experience if you're looking at the situation square on and honestly. Uh, they are anxiety, forlornness, and despair. Right? Anxiety, because we're absolutely free, it's up to us, but we're absolutely responsible for the choices and actions that we do. It's not somebody else. It's us. So I'll put it this way. When you get into this class and you apply a formulation of Kant's categorical imperative, if things don't go well or somebody's feelings get hurt or somebody physically gets hurt, who's responsible for that? Kant? No. You. Right? So, it's your freedom, it's your responsibility. That's the tension that Sartre is going to work on. And what Sartre is pointing out is that you should be anxious. Right? The other thing that Sartre is pointing out is something more general I want to say about this course. Ethics is not a finished discipline. You're, you're thinking I'm your professor and I know the difference between right and wrong and I'm going to tell you that. Most people that are hawking the difference between right and wrong as, you know, a doctrine are selling you something. They're trying to manipulate you into doing what they want you to do. Not cert. Not in the context of this class. That's not what we're doing in this class. I'm not proselytizing. I'm not beating doctrine into you. What I'm doing is giving you the tools to analyze moral theory. So at the end of this course, I expect you should be a little forlorn. I took an entire course in ethical theory and I still don't know apodictic, with apodictic certainty what the, the right thing to do is and what is wrong. No, you're, you're capable of researching, thinking critically, analyzing, and arguing at the end of this course. Right? So ethics is not a finished discipline, which is why Sartre is going to point out that you should feel forlorn. Right? That is, you should feel as though you have no real justification. You have to make it up yourself. You have to come to your own conclusions. There's nobody that's going to tell you what to do. Or if somebody does tell you what to do, that still doesn't alleviate your responsibility. And then Sartre is also going to point out to you that despair is a thing. What sort of a thing is despair? Sometimes you can do everything right and it still doesn't work out. This is, this is where we are. We're free. We're free beings, but we're free in the context of a world that doesn't care what we want or hope for or respect our plans. So, you can do the good and virtuous thing. Stand up for your principle and it still not work out. That doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means that that's life, right? So, the world doesn't owe you something. Anyhow, um, what I try to do in this course is build sort of an arc. Various themes are going to come out of these texts that we'll explore throughout the course of the semester. Uh, I mean, towards the end of the semester, about start, at some point I will point out and now we're back to Socrates. All right. So these are your texts. I rely on them heavily, buy them, get them somehow, Beg, borrow, steal them. No, don't steal them. Don't do that. But um, nonetheless, they're, they're common enough, and um, only in the one scenario 
Uh, do I expect you'll have any sort of problem getting this text? Right. And I've handled that for you. So um, those are your books. On to assignments next, because I'm sure you want to know how you get an A in this class.